Dr. Zerbriggan is a professor in the psychology department at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she also served as vice chair of the department. Um, she attended Michigan State University and graduated magna cum laude with a BS in zoology, which I found interesting given that we're talking about teenagers today, uh, followed by an MS in computer science, also very relevant to teenagers. Her doctoral dissertation in personality psychology at the University of Michigan received the University of Michigan Psychology Department Marquee Award, uh, which, was a, which is awarded annually for the most outstanding doctoral dissertation in psychology. She completed postdoctoral fellowships in the Department of Psychology at NYU and the Department of Psychology at the University of Oregon. Her research interests include the connections between power and sex, sexual aggression and abuse, trauma, sexual decision-making, sexuality and media, equalization and objectification of girls and women, authoritarianism, feminist political psychology, and motivation, especially power and affiliation intimacy motives. She was the chair of the American Psychological Association Task Force on the Equalization of Girls from 2005 to 2007. I'm oh, sorry, on the sexualization of girls. She currently serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of Trauma and Dissociation and the Journal of Personality. Dr. Zerbriggan is author to over 40 scholarly articles and co-editor to a book entitled The Sexualization of Girls and Girlhood. So I wanted to call attention in your books to um, this brochure. This is a named lecture. This is uh, a lecture given um, in memory and honor of Dr. Strat uh, Dimitriou. And this is the 13th annual uh, Dimitrio lecture. And if, if I'm correct, it's the first to be given by a psychologist. So we're delighted to have her here with us on lecturing on countering sexualization and creating a holistic norm. Please, wel please join me in welcoming Dr. Subrigan. Well, uh, welcome, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation to speak. It's uh, really wonderful to be here. I'm going to talk to you today um, about some possible views of sexual health that can help all of us to think about how we can counter sexualization and to create a holistic norm for sexual health. Um, so in working to promote sexual health, especially among adolescents, it's challenging to talk about sexuality in a full way. And there are a variety of reasons for this, including cultural and historical. So for example, our Puritan heritage, but as well as political. And um, <clears throat> you may recall Jocelyn Elders, who for a brief moment was um, Surgeon General of the US in the, in the early 90s. And um, you may also recall what led to her short tenure. It was, um, she had the temerity to talk about masturbation and um, because there was such a huge uh, controversy about that, I think we sometimes forget actually what it is that she said. So I just want to let you know what that was. Someone in a Q&A asked her if masturbation could perhaps help prevent the spread of AIDS. And this is what she replied. She said, I think that is something that is a part of human sexuality, and it's a part of something that, that perhaps should be taught. So just even that very mild uh, statement caused this huge uproar and uh, led to her, her resignation. Um, and we're thinking about uh, you know, sexual health. We can also term it reproductive health. And you know, I think it's just interesting to note that that is the less controversial title that is used for this conference, even though you know, in the description and the objectives and so forth, sexual health is mentioned. But um, it's just a little bit less controversial to talk about um, reproductive health rather than to say the sex word. Um, but you know, a lot of what we're trying to do is help to prevent things like um, sexually transmitted infections, which are, after all, sexually transmitted, um, yet even so we have difficulties in talking fully about sexuality, including desire and arousal. One of the reasons for this, of course, is the dominance that abstinence only until marriage um, sex ed programs have had in the, in the recent past, um, which made it difficult to talk about sexuality in a full way. Um, but even if we look at comprehensive sex ed uh, programs such as the um, 
those that are described by uh, CECAS, they have their guidelines for comprehensive sexuality education. And I went through this and I looked for um, places where sexual arousal were, was mentioned or sexual desire. And um, there's very few. Um, this is one of them. Uh, boys and men get erections and girls and women experience vaginal lubrication during sexual arousal. So it acknowledges that it exists but presents it in a pretty clinical way. Orgasm is an intense pleasurable release of sexual feelings or tension experienced at the peak of sexual arousal. Again, acknowledging that you know orgasm happens but kind of talking about it clinically. And then the third place uh, where it's mentioned is in this sentence, sexual feelings, fantasies, and desires occur throughout life, are natural, and, and do not need to be acted upon. So, and, you know, and I'm not criticizing uh, CECAS further guidelines by any means. It's very challenging, especially when working with adolescents, to, to navigate this tension. But it's just interesting to, to look at that. Um, so in, in our work, it can be really hard to talk about this. But our broader culture is definitely not so reticent. And we see sexualized messages um, everywhere, basically, in advertising and entertainment. We see it, um, we see it in sports. So this is uh, the Beijing Olympics, a, a women's uh, volleyball uh, athletes wear very sexualized uniforms. Uh, and even in politics, this is um, a picture of Sarah Palin's legs from the 2008 presidential election. Um, and I, I have been working on particularly the sexualization of girls rather than adult women. Um, and th this is a phenomenon that's happening in our culture as well. You may recall Miley, Silas, uh, Miley Cyrus's photos that appeared in Vanity Fair a few years ago. She was 15 at the time um, in, in the sexualized portrayal. Um, more recently, this past summer, there's a very young French model, um, Tilan Blondeau, um, who appear, has been appearing in French Vogue in poses such as this, whoops, and this, um, and she's a 10-year-old girl. So um, uh, a lot of people have been um, writing about that as well, saying that this is something that perhaps we don't want to be seeing. Um, most images in the media are of white people, but people of color are sexualized too. Here's a couple examples. And um, there's a particularly egregious example um, about a year and a half ago. This is a billboard that appeared in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and I'm not sure how, how you can really see it from the back, but it's, um, I don't know if this doesn't scream oral sex. I don't know what does. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was put up in a, a neighborhood that was predominantly lower income, African American. Um, this was taken down pretty quickly because there was a large outcry against it. And it, it's a jeans ad also, by the way. Um, all of us, including adolescent girls, are told how to be sexy by the media. We get this message from a lot of different sources, um, including media such as magazines. And this is Cosmo Girl magazine. So this is the younger version of Cosmo. You know, ostensibly this is the older teens who are reading this, but in reality, the older teens are reading, you know, the real Cosmo, full strength Cosmo. And this is girls who are 10 or 11 who are reading this. And what are the messages they get? Um, they're told that they're supposed to be gorgeous. They have to have sexy hair, perfect skin, a hotter body, so that they can hook up with boys and um, you know, sort of excite them to the, to the level that the, uh, these boys won't be able uh, to leave the girl alone even after she's done with them. Um, Cosmo and other magazines also have these online uh, sources of information which potentially could be a great way to communicate to girls. So they say, okay, you can come here and we will answer your most confusing questions about your body and about sexuality. Well, if you click and read more, um, what you see are um, a lot of questions uh, that maybe are not about health. So there were 13 questions about breasts, but six were questions about, are my breasts too small? Four others were different um, aspects of the appearance of breasts, and only three were actually about, about health. So there's a bit of a disjunction in our culture. On the one hand, the constraints about um, talking about sexuality are very strong, uh, so much so that the Surgeon General can be fired for simply mentioning masturbation. 
On the other hand, the broader culture is saturated with sexual messages. So as we think about promoting sexual health for adolescent girls and boys, um, I, I want to argue that we have to start talking about this disjunction. It's there for the people that you're seeing and working with, um, and we need to be thinking about it too. And so hopefully this talk, I don't have like final answers by any means, but I just am hoping that I can jumpstart a conversation and you can start thinking about this more and talking to each other about this. So let me just uh, walk you through the goals of my talk. So first of all, I want to introduce you to the concept of sexualization as it was defined by the task force that I served on, um, the American Psychological Association Task Force. Uh, the second thing that I want to do is present a kind of a broad psychological model that might be helpful in thinking about this and particularly thinking about the effects that sexualization has on adolescent girls. And then finally, I want to give you some examples of what I think of as more holistic visions of sexual health for you to think about, for you to talk about, um, and for you to build on in your own work. So let me start uh, with talking a little bit about sexualization. So again, I'm uh, working in the framework of this uh, task force report that was put out a few years ago. And uh, I think most of you have actually a, a glossy copy of this report in your packet. You can also go um, to the conference website to download or to the um, APA website, the American Psychological Association website, to download a, a full PDF. There's also an executive summary there and um, some <coughs> tips for parents. And so this report um, was released uh, in 2007 and provided a summary of research concerning both the prevalence of sexualization as well as the effects of it. So uh, what do I mean by sexualization? I'm going to start right there uh, and define it for you. Sexualization occurs uh, when any one of four um, things is present. Uh, sexualization occurs if or any time a person's value comes primarily from their sexual appeal or behavior to the exclusion of other characteristics. That's the first criteria. Um, the second, a person um, is sexualized if they are held to a standard that equates physical attractiveness with being sexy. And usually this is a very narrow standard of physical attractiveness that's um, very specific, it's very narrow, it's uh, essentially unattainable for most people. The third component of the definition, a person is sexualized if and when they are sexually objectified. In other words, any time that they're made into a passive thing that other people will use sexually or any time their sexuality is commodified. Uh, which then limits the possibilities for independent action and decision making of that person, turns them into an object rather than an actor. And then finally, um, sexualization occurs any time um, sexuality is imposed inappropriately, for example, if a young child is sexualized and portrayed in a sexual manner. Um, and according to the definition that we came up with on the task force, all four of these don't have to be present. If any one of them is present, we would say that sexualization is occurring. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about these four components and give you some examples just to cement that for you a bit more. So starting with the first criteria, um, sexualization occurs when people are valued only for their sexuality. So here are some examples of products, t-shirts that uh, adolescent girls might wear. Um, and these are t-shirts that actually brand girls in a particular way. They're telling us what's important about girls and what that is, is that they're sexy and that they're candy or a tasty treat for boys. And even young girls learn this lesson. So this is, a, we have a picture of a very young girl in a beauty pageant who's um, emulating an adult sexualized uh, form of beauty. And the picture on the right hand side is a, um, it's a uh, sort of like a, a makeover club in uh, Washington, D.C. that's uh, called Club Libby Lou, but it's for young girls to kind of come and dress up as models. You know, and of course, imaginative play is fine. It's great. Um, I have nothing against that. But if we kind of constrain girls that most of their imaginative play is about trying to be sexy and uh, sexy in an adult way, do have a problem with that. And in the story that accompanied this picture, they actually um, interviewed the mom of one of the girls and she was coming to Club Luby Lou to do her makeover as a reward because she had been on the honor roll and her mom said you know she's really smart she's a brainiac and then they asked the girl what do you want to be 
she didn't say doctor, you know, she didn't say, um, she didn't even say lawyer, she said model. So um, when we constrain uh, and tell girls and teach girls that their value is really only in being sexy, it really limits their, um, their imagination for themselves. Um, the next, I'm going to talk about uh, the, uh, two of the other characteristics now, the narrow standard and the objectification component. And this is an ad, um, a perfume ad, Dior Addict, that exemplifies both of these. So in terms of a narrow standard, this image, and this is uh, you know, not an uncommon image, we see images like this all the time in advertising. This image tells us that only physically attractive people are sexy, and that physical attractiveness is very, very narrowly defined. Very particular body type, um, thin but with breasts, white uh, skin and perfect skin, full lips. Um, this is also an example of sexual objectification we have a focus on the body parts, not on the person as a whole. Um, her breasts and torso are kind of the point of this ad. The viewer is supposed to uh, consume that and be titillated by that. In this particular ad, this model actually seems to be in pain a little bit. Um, and the product name, Dior Addict, and the slogan, which I'm not sure if you can uh, see that right down in the bottom right-hand corner, but it's admit it. Um, it implies perhaps that she is an addict. Um, and perhaps helpless in the face of her addiction, therefore more vulnerable. And admit it could also be interpreted as something along the lines of admit it, you did want to have sex, um, which is a, you know, a common refrain, uh, victim blaming refra refrain after women uh, are sexually assaulted. Um, one more example of the narrow standard, this is uh, one of the covers from a, a Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition. And here, um, you know, other than two models who don't have blonde hair and uh, very slight differences in the bikini bottom size, these women are completely interchangeable from each other. Um, so th there's a very, very narrow standard about what it means to be a beautiful or sexy in this culture. And then down in the right-hand corner, we have a tennis star who is being sexualized as well, and I'll come back to this in just a minute. Um, Again, most media images in the U.S. are of white people, but women of color, when they appear, they can be sexualized as well. And sometimes the sexualization is racialized. So um, Latina women, African American women, can be portrayed as exotic with uh, flowery costumes or, or um, uh, posed in a, like a jungle environment. Sometimes they're connected to animals, for example, by being posed in leopard prints, animal skin prints. Asian American women are sometimes portrayed as subservient. So this is a woman who appears to be chained or, or bound up with this expensive jewelry. Um, so it's important to keep in mind some of the differences in which um, uh, women and girls can be sexualized depending on aspects of their identity. Um, and the final component of sexualization in our definition was inappropriate imposition of sexuality when it's imposed from the outside onto someone who does not want to be sexualized or in a situation that is clearly not sexual. <clears throat> and one of my favorite examples of this was the U.S. Um, World Cup Finals in 1999, where um, this is kind of a uh, little bit uh, ancient history now that we have a new women's uh, team that was very exciting recently. But um, in, in that 1999 World Cup Finals, um, after 30 minutes of overtime, a tense series of penalty kicks, um, Brandy Chastain scored the winning goal for the U.S. team, making them world champions. It was an incredibly exciting moment for women, uh, for women's sports. And as is common with male soccer players, <coughs> Chastain ripped off her shirt in celebration. Um, but as is not common um, for male soccer players, this um, jubilation about her amazing academic achievement and the achievement of her team was sexualized by many sports casters with references to her stripped tees. She was called um, the owner of the most talked about breasts in the country. And by association, her whole team was sexualized, sexualized with one commentator referring to the team as, quote, the booters with hooters. So um, I think this is a really clear example of sexuality being imposed um, inappropriately and actually ridiculously. I mean, I don't see how anyone can look at that picture and say that that is a striptease. That's a really, um, a, a, just a, re, a really ridiculous interpretation of it. Um, 
so this uh, speaks to the fourth element of the definition, um, but the comments also seem to suggest that Chastain's value actually comes from her sexuality and her body and her breasts rather than um, her, her athletic achievement and um, uh, the amazing um, victory that she and her team had put together. Um, the report talks and is focused a lot on particularly the sexualization of younger girls rather than women or older adolescents. And I'm um, just give you a couple of quick examples of media images that do that. The, uh, both of these are, um, are older models, but they're made to look like girls with um, the pigtails and kind of a pornographic pose. Um, this is a, another Dior addict ad with a model who's made to look younger, twirling her hair with, um, with a little girl underwear on. There's also toys that are marketed to young girls that are pretty sexualized. So the Bratz dolls are kind of infamous for their, um, their uh, kind of controversial uh, um, clothing that makes them look like they might be streetwalkers. Um, but Barbie has had to sex it up as well to keep up. So this is bling bling Barbie who's wearing a very, very short miniskirt and not too much else. Um, periodically, there are some outrage when uh, people say different products that are, are coming into uh, the market that are sexualized. So Bratz has been making, uh, quote, bralettes for young girls. And these are girls like who are six. Um, and they're little padded bras. So I think most people can agree that that's really, um, that's really not necessary for little girls to be wearing and would be an inappropriate imposition of sexuality. So uh, now you have an idea of what sexualization is and have seen some examples of how women and adolescent girls and even young girls can be sexualized. And I want to talk to you really quickly about the prevalence of sexualization. So this was one of the um, tasks of our, of our work was to look to see what research has been conducted on how prevalent sexualization is. And just in brief, uh, every study pretty much that has been done has found that sexualization is, is widely prevalent. So in a pretty much every media format studied, television, sports media, video games, internet, advertising, etc. cetera. Um, and just a, a quick sample of some studies. In television, uh, female characters are more likely than male characters to be provocatively dressed. And one study that looked at 81 TV episodes found that more than 80% had at least one incident of sexual harassment in the program. The average number per episode was 3.4, and these included both sexist comments, like calling women broad, bimbo, or dumbass, and sexual comments, um, uh, se sexist comments as well as sexual comments, so referring to body parts like knockers or hooters. Um, music videos are also kind of notorious for the high levels of sexual content that uh, they have, including showing women dressed in provocative clothing, showing them serve, serving as decorative objects, being portrayed as sexually available. Um, men in these videos are often portrayed in a highly sexed way as well, but as sexual actors or sexual players who are wanting to sleep with many women. Um, and hip hop and rap uh, videos are very, they're actually very notorious for this and there's plenty of uh, sexualization in these videos. This is a clip from uh, uh, a video by uh, Nelly called Tip Drill that uh, really came into the public eye when the uh, women of Spelman College protested against, um, against Nelly and against this video. But um, research has shown that other genres also have sexualizing images, including country music and just any music videos that are shown on TV. Um, we have some very uh, clearly sexualized uh, pop groups like the Pussycat Dolls um, and you know, a huge um, star right now, Lady Gaga, who always pretty much presents herself in a very sexualized way. Um, music lyrics have been studied less systematically, but one study that was fairly comprehensive looking at 164 songs by 16 artists found that uh, a minority, but a good number of these lyrics sexually degraded women. And some of the more egregious examples are here, they refer to women as hoes, um, prostitutes, and um, really uh, focus on body parts and, and sexually objectify them. So there's a lot more in the task force report. If you're interested in reading more studies about the prevalence of sexualization, and uh, more research has been conducted since that time as well. 
But what I want to move on now to do is to uh, talk to you about a kind of a broad psychological mediation model that can help us think about sexualization and the effects that it would have on young people and adolescent girls. Um, so the model is uh, here. Uh, I will walk you through it, but this is the overview. Sexual socialization happens to young people. They internalize those messages, and then that leads to sexual behaviors. So starting just from the, um, the, the source of uh, these, uh, the sexual sexualization, um, uh, there's a lot of socialization around sexuality that occurs, and I've talked a little bit about the media, and that's a huge source. But other people provide sexual messages. Parents, peers, teachers, healthcare providers are giving messages to young people about sexuality. Um, institutions as well take positions on sexuality and uh, communicate values, they communicate knowledge, they communicate attitudes, schools, churches, government, and so forth. Um, the main message, at least that the media communicates about uh, sexuality, for women it's that being attractive and sexy is very important. For men it's that sex and sexual conquest are very important. And as mentioned in the definition of sexualization, Attractive is very narrowly defined, um, and the message really is that women are objects rather than actors. So in this model, all of these messages from outside uh, are taken in by, uh, by everyone, including by adolescents, uh, leading to changes in their attitudes and their beliefs and their values, um, leading to changes in scripts that they have about sexuality that they're uh, potentially going to enact. And we can think uh, both for the, um, the external socialization that's happening, as well as for this internal change that's happening in people. Is this, would we consider these healthy messages and internal changes or not healthy? Um, and I want to briefly introduce you to something called self-objectification. There's been a lot of research on this uh, concept. And um, it's an aspect of an internalized sexuality that seems to be pretty important for women. So this is based on um, something called objectification theory. And this theory says that when uh, we are exposed to sexualizing cultural messages, which happens to women and girls more than to men, what happens is that women learn to internalize a third person view of themselves. So, um, and this includes constantly assessing, how do I look? Am I, am I attractive? Uh, do people find me sexy? Um, am I measuring up? Basically, um, because of the sexualization in the environment, girls and women learn to think of their bodies as something that can be looked at or are being looked at, um, rather than as something that allows them to do things out in the world. So again, internalizing this idea of what do I look like, rather than thinking about what am I thinking and what can I do and um, how can I act in the world. And uh, the hypothesis is that sexualization will lead to self-objectification. And in fact, there's a great deal of evidence to support this claim. Some of it is correlational, so that we have these studies that ask people how much sexualizing media they've been exposed to. And we see that that is connected to self-objectification. And um, there's also a research that's experimental that's showing a connection between exposure to sexualizing media uh, and self-objectification, um, and also um, things that go along with that, like dissatisfaction with your body and shame about your body. And uh, so many studies have been done, actually, that three meta-analyses have been published. So this finding that the sexualization in the media leads to self-objectification and body dissatisfaction in women and girls is pretty well supported. And then the final component of, that, of the model is, OK, so these changes have happened for, um, for adolescent girls uh, and, and boys, too, in their mind. Um, and then that can lead to sexual behaviors, changes in sexual behaviors, which again can be thought of as, are these, are these healthy behaviors or are these behaviors that are maybe not so healthy? For example, risky sexual behaviors. And I'll give you a few examples of some of the research that's been conducted to investigate this link. Um, and in general, the finding is that um, these internalized unhealthy um, sexual attitudes or beliefs self-objectification, body shame, appearance anxiety, 
These are associated with diminished sexual health in adolescent girls. So um, girls who, who have this self-objectified sense of themselves, they're less likely to use condoms. They have lower self-efficacy around condom use, so they're, they are less, um, they have less of a sense that they actually are gonna be able to use condoms. They uh, do more sexual risk taking, so they most likely are at greater risk of contracting STIs, although this, um, this piece hasn't, that actual outcome piece hasn't been documented yet to my knowledge. Um, other aspects of sexual health are associated with self-objectification and its correlates as well. So girls who self-objectify are less assertive about their own sexual needs. They experience less sexual arousal and sexual pleasure. They have negative attitudes about menstruation and also about breastfeeding. They're very embarrassed to think about breastfeeding. We, we can also think about how the sexualization of women may harm boys and men. Uh, and there's not too much uh, research on this, but it may, there may be some harm to boys and men if they're exposed to objectifying portrayals of women. Research has shown that this causes men to rate real women, including their own partner, as less attractive and leads them to experience more anxiety and hostility. Um, also, there's a couple studies, including one that I just recently published, show, shows that if men have objectifying beliefs about women in general, or in particular, if they're objectifying their own romantic partner, they are less satisfied with the relationship and they're less satisfied sexually. So um, in a way, I think these are encouraging results in the sense that we can maybe use them to help convince young men that um, it's not actually in their own best interest to be objectifying the women around them, that it's gonna actually maybe lead to negative emotions for them and relationships that aren't as satisfying and sex sex that is not as satisfying. Um, so there are these possible harms um, that uh, uh, boys, um, more speculatively, I guess, boys may actually be at risk for um, committing domestic violence if they learn to objectify women. They may be unable to relate to not only their female partners, but their coworkers, their friends. Um, if they're thinking, if they have learned that all women are treated as sexual objects, this can be a problem in the, in the workplace and other places. Um, and they may learn to see themselves in limited ways. Um, the, the only thing that they are is a sexual player, which really limits their, um, their sexual pleasure, their sexual health, but also could be, uh, I think, pretty clearly a risk factor for, um, for STIs. So um, this is one way to think about how all of this affects boys and men. Um, but are, are boys sexually objectified as well? Um, studies show that this is much, much less frequent for men and boys, but it is starting to happen as images like these show. These are very, um, uh, you know, pictures that are focused on body parts and a, a pretty narrow standard for men as well. It's not, uh, not everyone can look like this. Very, very few people can. Um, so men can be objectified as well, and it may be that this is more of a problem for gay men and, um, and young men than for straight men. Which uh, brings us to the point of, yeah, what about sexual minorities? Um, lesbian sexuality has been, uh, has been sexualized in the media. This is the very famous kiss between Britney Spears and Madonna at the MTV Music Video Awards a few years ago. Um, and this becomes a performance for uh, mostly for heterosexual men and young men rather than for the women themselves. And um, I'm worried I'm gonna run out of time, so I'm gonna just move on quickly. We don't have very much research on, on sexual minorities, but a few studies have been conducted. And we need more of such studies. We also need, um, we need research on other diverse groups. Um, there are differences or maybe differences depending on race, ethnicity, and culture. Disability and sexuality is an incredibly under-researched area, um, but I think it's very important to think about in this context. Disabled individuals are often objectified in non-sexual ways, um, and uh, studies show that they're at higher risk of sexual abuse. So that uh, connection, I think, makes it very important to think about how they might be sexually objectified as well. We also have relatively research looking, relatively little research looking directly at social class but this also is a gap that needs to be remedied because there certainly are many uh, class-based stereotypes that revolve around sexuality. So uh, all of these areas are ripe for future research. Um, so uh, 
I've talked to you a little bit about what is sexualization and given you some examples. I've talked to you very briefly about some of the studies that show that sexualization is related to uh, negative uh, internal constructions of sexuality and that those are associated uh, with uh, unhealthy sexual behaviors. But I want to close, or in the last part of the talk, uh, give you some ideas about how we can think about sexuality differently and give you a sampling of some possible holistic visions of sexual health. And um, the, you know, I'm not by any means saying that I have any final answers or there's any gold standard of what sexual health. I think all of us are engaged in this process of, of figuring out what it is, what we think it is, and what, what sexual health uh, is for the, the adolescents and the families that we work with. But I'm hoping that these will be some examples that will trigger your thinking, give you something to talk about here, as well as when you go back to your practice. So I'm going to start with some um, definitions of sexual health that have been put out there recently by some of the major organizations in the field. The second thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make a, a deliberate contrast with sexualization, um, sort of saying, well, let's start from sexualization we know is not good. Uh, what's the opposite of that? Maybe that would be considered sexual health. And then I have two um, scholars, one's a, a psychologist and the other's a feminist activist, who I think have some really interesting ideas um, about what, what they think sexual health is. So those are the four um, visions that I'm going to talk you through in this part of my talk. Um, so the World Health Organization uh, obviously has information about lots and lots of different health issues. They have a section of their website that's devoted to sexual health. And here is uh, the component of the definition that's there. So they say that sexual health is a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being related to sexuality. It requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality. It involves the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences. These experiences, uh, if they're healthy, are free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. And then finally, the sexual rights of all persons must be respected. So it talks about rights, it talks about safety, it talks about pleasure, it talks about respect, it talks about well-being. Um, one thing that, that's not present in this definition is a description of sexual health as the absence of disease, dysfunction, infirmity. So it's a very uh, kind of forward-thinking, positive view of sexual health. Um, so, uh, so that's one, one vision of that. The American Social Health Association um, also has a website, or part of the website also is focused on sexual health. They quote the, the WHO definition, um, but they move even more from a disease model in, in their website. So they say, uh, these are some quotes, sexual health includes far more than avoiding disease or unplanned pregnancy. So they say it's straight out. Um, we're not talking about a, like a lack of a deficit. We have a bigger vision than that. And then they go so far as to say that having an STI or an unwanted pregnancy doesn't prevent someone from being or becoming sexually healthy. So they're trying to really have an expanded vision of sexual health that I think is really exciting. Um, and then the, I had mentioned the uh, report on comprehensive sex ed that Sikas put out a few years ago. It doesn't really mention sexual arousal and desire very much. Um, but it does have a definition of sexual health that I think has a lot of really great components to it. So in their report, they talk about sexual health as um, meaning that one should appreciate one's own, one owns body, that you interact with all genders in a respectful and appropriate way, that you develop and maintain meaningful relationships, that you avoid exploitative or manipulative relationships, and that you enjoy and express your sexuality through your life in ways that are congruent with your values. And I really like um, th these components. It's clear that respect for yourself and for other people are, are very central to this definition. Um, they've also very recently put together or put out a strategic plan for 2012 to 2016 that is titled Creating a Sexually Healthy America. So they are taking on this idea of visioning sexual health in a very direct and exciting way. And this is, um, I'm, you can download this strategic plan from their website. 
and I'm just quoting here um, a little snippet from that. They say, only when sexually health is more widely understood as focused on positive benefits and not simply about mitigating harm will Americans of all ages have greater options for achieving their own personal sense of sexual health and well-being. Today, we have the opportunity to build the first generation of sexually healthy adults, and they're taking that on as their goal. We intend to seize this opportunity by defining, framing, and supporting a new public discourse, and they want that discourse to shift the paradigm on sexual health and well-being and to create a sexually healthy America. So they're really laying it out there. This is their goal. This is their vision. We're going to move away from this idea of just mitigating harm, and we're, we're really going to help young people. We're going to try to transform sexuality in this country. Fantastic. Um, the second vision, so I recommend that you go and look at those websites if you haven't already done it, because there's a lot of exciting stuff there. Uh, the second piece, uh, the second vision for healthy sexuality is really just a compare contrast. So let's look at those elements of sexualization and what's the opposite of them. We can think of that as sexual health. So we have the first component was that um, sexualization occurs when someone's value comes primarily from their sex appeal or their sexual behavior. And the opposite of that would be that we acknowledge and value sexuality as one of many aspects of ourselves and of other people. So we don't stay narrow, we broaden it. There's so many things to value about people. The second component of that sex, uh, sexualization is when we equate their sexual appeal with a narrow standard of physical attractiveness. In sexual health, we can recognize that there are many ways in which people can be sexy and attractive. So you can be sexy because you're smart, because uh, you have certain skills, your sense of humor, your personality. All of these have been lost in this, uh, this sexualizing um, context where the only thing that matters is that you look a certain way. Uh, the third piece, uh, it, sexualization occurs when women are objectified and made into things for other people to use. So in contrast, sexual health, if we, if we have sexual health, we are respecting the agency and the autonomy of every person all the time. And then finally, sexualization occurs when sexuality is imposed inappropriately. So in sexual health, in contrast, all sexual acts would be founded on full and free consent. So that was the second vision, which I hope is helpful to you. And then I have two um, scholars that have said some things that I think are really interesting that I want to share with you. The first one is Lena Bay Chang, who's a psychologist and a uh, clinical social worker at uh, SUNY Buffalo. And she has a very recent paper with a couple of colleagues um, that involved focus groups with adolescent girls. And um, you're very, I very much encourage you to read this paper, but uh, it, I'll just give you a few snippets of her findings. Um, so she found that um, personal responsibility in sexual decisions is important, but we also have to think about social inequities. These constrain individual choice and behavior. So we're talking a lot about individuals, but everyone is situated in this broader context, and it constrains us, and it affects us. Sexuality can serve many goals and is embedded in the larger structure of life. And sexual exploration, uh, which necessarily involves risk, all exploration involves risk. Um, but for adolescents, that's a crucially important and necessary part of their development. And our job is to provide a safe environment. So let me expand on that just a little bit. Um, in this focus group study, she brought these uh, adolescent girls together. And uh, here's a couple of things that they said. They really valued these peer discussions in part because they were allowed to be confused. They were allowed to, uh, for things to be ambiguous. They were allowed to talk about sex in a complex way. Um, whereas, in contrast, they said that it, with conversation with adults, it often felt very simplified. You know, it's like, don't get pregnant, don't have sex, use a condom. Um, and they, they just want to talk about it in a much more complicated way. They also wanted what um, Bei Chen calls an evocative relationship with adults. They don't want to just be a recipient of like, here, you know, here's this information, let me just, you know, provide it to you and give it to you. They want to talk back as well. They have things to say. Um, and uh, just a bit more about how she defines evocative relationships. Um, and this is Bei Cheng's conclusion. Positive, healthy sexuality is not something that can be instilled in or delivered to girls. We maybe would like to just plug in and, and just put it there in their brains, but we can't do that. It's something that they have to cultivate for themselves. They have to produce for themselves. 
over the course of education, experience, contemplation, and conversation. So it's those things that we can provide to them, education, conversation, but they're doing this themselves. You know, they're becoming adults. Um, they're, they're, they're building their sexuality for themselves. And so thinking about that two-way relationship can be very, um, very helpful. And then uh, she has this metaphor that I think is fantastic, um, focusing on this idea that sexual exploration is part of adolescent development. Becoming a sexual person is one of the things we want our, our young people to do. And she points out that we don't, um, we don't teach infants to crawl or walk by moving their limbs for them. We recognize that even though they fall over, they have to do this for themselves. It's, you know, we can't do it for them. Um, and of course, we want to minimize risk so that if crawling is unsafe because the floor is dirty or littered with broken glass, the appropriate response is not to confine and restrict the child from crawling, but to clean up the mess. So um, it's kind of easy to think about it for an infant and harder to think about it for the adolescents with all the many, many challenges that they face. But I really like this, uh, this metaphor and thinking about, yeah, well, what can we do to clean up the mess for our young people so that they're able to explore in appropriate and safe ways their sexuality? Because really, they need to do that. They need to do that. So how can we help them? And then I finally um, want to share with you some thoughts from John Stoltenberg, who is a, um, a feminist activist uh, and writer who I think just has some really, really interesting um, essays. Uh, one of his books is called Refusing to Be a Man, Essays on Sex and Justice, which I highly recommend to you. There's one essay in here that I'm going to just uh, summarize for you. The essay is called What is Good Sex? And Stoltenberg makes this uh, super interesting point that good, you know, if we're talking about what is good, that's a philosophical question. It's an important question. It's a profound question. And like all philosophical question, questions, it demands that we meet that question with all of our powers of imagination and comprehend comprehension. In the field of philosophy, good uh, can have two meanings. There's an aesthetic meaning, and there's also an ethics meaning. And he talks about both of these. So aesthetics, of course, is the study of what is beautiful and pleasing to our senses, what gives us pleasure. And ethics is about ethical values, such as respect, justice, equality, and empathy. And Stoltenberg makes the point that good sex is both of these. It's both about aesthetics and pleasure, and it's about ethics and values and respecting others. And in fact, when we think about that, it brings up this really interesting question. What is the relationship between pleasurable sensation and principled action? Um, can we really divorce those from each other and still have a healthy sexuality? Or do we need to think about those uh, in concert? And this is also a political question that requires us to think about power differences in a dyad or in, with an individual, but also uh, power differences more globally. And just a couple more things that he says about good sex. Uh, he states that if it's good, it's not going to reinforce power imbalances. It's going to repudiate them. He points out that trust and fairness and intimacy are key for good sex. And that when sex is good, people are finding their own authentic, unique path. They're defining their own sexuality. They're not just acting out a script. Sex is not separate from the rest of our lives. Um, if we want to have a principled life in general, we have to have a principled sex life as well. Um, so I'm going to end with two quotations from, St from Stoltenberg. And um, for me, they represent a lot of what I would most like to communicate about sexuality to any adolescent who I cared about or who was in my care in any way. So I invite you to think about whether these resonate for you as well. Um, so the first quote here uh, is talking about an authentic erotic potential, something that's really authentic. I'm not sure a lot of us have this in our sex life in the ways that we might want to, but. Um, but I would say that for our younger generation, if we're trying to create this first generation of sexually healthy people, this is one of the things I'd want for them. So Stoltenberg says, let's assume that there does exist an authentic erotic potential between humans, such that mutuality, reciprocity, fairness, deep communication and affection, total body integrity for both partners, and equal capacity for choice making and decision making are merged with robust physical pleasure, intense sensation, and brimming over expressiveness. 
So he's like, let's assume that it, we can do this, that we can have the aesthetics and the ethics both, and that this is, we're really going to have a fantastic sexuality if we do that. And then his la the last quote from him, he says, we need to begin to understand more about what is going on between us when we have sex, the values in it, how it is related to the rest of our lives, how it is related to how we treat people, and how it is related to political change. And we need to talk about it all, face to face, one to one, before, during, and after. Our bodies have learned many lies. If we dare to be ruthly, ruthlessly honest, we can perhaps recover truth. So um, that's, the, that's the last a vision of sexuality, of sexual health. Um, I invite you to think about whether it resonates for you or whether, whether it, um, there, it stimulates you to, uh, to think about sexual health. And hopefully this can be part of the conversation today and uh, going forward in the work that we're all doing. Thank you so much.